Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. All right. Hey, listeners, we are back again. Uh, One of the great things, or not great things, but silver linings of pandemic is that we've been pretty regular uh, here on Fortress on a Hill. Uh, We've been doing great, great interviews, you know, on a weekly basis. Uh, Many of you probably listen to Chris Hedges and Bob Shear. Um, We just had... um, Rebecca Gordon, who will be that episode will release uh, probably by the time you hear this. And uh, and now we are just super lucky to have Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, uh, the historian, uh, just kind of long time analyst and activist. And we're really excited for this. And we have so many more great interviews coming and the quality of guests has just really gone through the roof. So thank you so much, uh, Roxanne, for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm a great fan of, of your podcast. Well, you know, uh, at, at, just before I introduce you, I was going to say, uh, when you indicated in our, you know, back and forth scheduling emails uh, that you were uh, a Fort on Hill listener, I think we were all, all three of us, pretty stoked and flattered. Uh, we're all familiar with your work. Uh, I believe, Kagan, is that right, uh, was midway through uh, the Indigenous People's History when I told him you were joining us. Um, I just started it. It's so good. And uh, it really is. It, it really is excellent. And we're going to talk about that and, and some of your other work. So let me just do a quick uh, bio for those who, who aren't fully familiar with you. Um, Roxanne is a historian, first and foremost, author, memoirist, and a speaker who researches a Western Hemisphere history and international human rights. Uh, She grew up in rural Oklahoma, the daughter of a tenant farmer and part Indian mother. She has been active in the international, that's key, international indigenous movement for more than four decades. And she's known for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. Uh, After receiving her PhD in history at the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA, she taught in the newly established Native American Studies program at Cal State University Hayward and helped found the departments of ethnic studies and women's studies. And that really was a key period when when these sort of programs were first really getting their genesis. Her 1977 book, The Great Sioux Nation, uh, was the fundamental document at the first international conference on indigenous peoples of the Americas held at the United Nations headquarters in Geneva. Uh, She is the author or editor of several other books, including Roots of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico, Uh, And her two most recent works are An Indigenous People's History of the United States and Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, both of which, for equally, if differently disturbing reasons, feel particularly relevant to this peculiar and, you know, tragic moment of ours. So while this short biographical summary hardly does her extensive work and fascinating life justice, I'm quite certain we're going to dig into much of that during this episode. So Let me just say for now, uh, thanks again for doing this, Roxanne, and it's a genuine honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Well, as always, I'm known as the more loquacious of the uh, hosts, so I'll start us off. And, uh, you know, we're going to go in a lot of directions and do our best to um, 
to make this more than a, a corona analysis like so much media and reporting is today. So, you know, some of that uh, reasonable, some probably uh, distracting. But some listeners might best know you for your work on Native American history, what you call indigenous history, especially you're doing so in sort of the, the people's history vein uh, of Howard Zinn, who many listeners have probably heard of. So I'm quite sure you've been obliged to answer these sorts of questions a lot. Uh, but if you'll indulge me, to start, can you tell us uh, a bit about your background, personal scholastic journey, and how you came to the vast and complex subject of Native American or Indigenous history? Well, um, yeah, I came from, it, uh, my destiny, I think, was not determined by my childhood. Um, I was not supposed to uh, become who I became, I think, um, uh, but maybe I, I, I was. But I grew up in, um, uh, like you say, in uh, central rural Oklahoma. Uh, my dad was a sharecropper and tenant farmer and also drove a, a diesel truck um, fueling um, the richer farmers, the wheat farmers, uh, tanks uh, for their tractors um, and any other job he, he could get to support us. So we, I grew up very poor. Um, it was a poor community as such. It wasn't that unusual. Um, I measured wealth by people having an indoor bathroom, basically, <laughs> which we didn't. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and even electricity. So it was, a, it was a pretty harsh background, but I did have um, a history I inherited. My father's father was a um, socialist. I, I really liked your article, Benny, uh, your essay on, uh, on Eugene Debs, because my grandfather was a Debster and a socialist. Voted for Debs for five times. I never knew him. He died before I was born, but I heard endless stories from my father about him. <clears throat> my father was born in 1907, so he was very young during this period, but he had, uh, I think his dad sort of invested in him, you know, the stories because he had them. And there was nothing in my um, schooling that would make me think that these stories were true. It didn't really matter to me. It was, you know, the story of this wonderful man. <clears throat> and I don't know if it'll ring a bell, but he named my father uh, Moyer Haywood Scarberry Pettibone Dunbar. Those, yes, those are the names of the IWW founders who were on trial in August 1907 when my father was born. So my, just, you know, asking my father, tell me again about the names, your name. So he would tell me the biographies of Bill Moyer, Big Bill Haywood, Garberry, each of them they were hard rock miners, they were good people, and they were socialists. And so I, I'm the only kid. I was the youngest. I was asthmatic, sickly a lot, home a lot um, from school. And um, I was just a perfect uh, listening host for my father's stories. The oh, three older brothers and sisters were not interested. It took me years to prove to them that these stories were true, <laughs> you know, documentation. <laughs> so um, my father, obviously, he also joined the IWW. They were very strong. Oklahoma was very industrialized and from the 1880s. Oil was discovered. It was a big oil patch, uh, commercial wheat farming, uh, coal mining, uh, lots of immigrant labor, um, and uh, very wealthy uh, bosses. It was, it was like a little third world country with a dictatorship and all the press was controlled. So that's the circumstances I grew up in. And my last year of high school, I left home and I moved um, to the city to work and go to trade school my last year to become a secretary. But in that trade school, they also had a printing um, Printing was one of their, you know, and they did the daily newspaper. And one of the um, 
one of the trades that you could actually choose was journalism. So I slipped out of secretarial into journalism, <laughs> where all the cool people were. And um, I met gay people for the first time, or people who admitted they were gay, um, and uh, really kind of rebels. And it was a wonderful year experience. It was, it was a very um, kind of a scary place. You know, I went from three people in my class and in uh, this uh, little hamlet, Piedmont, to 350 students in my class and 1,000 students in the school. And um, it was the days of juvenile delinquency, and there were, um, there was actually heroin being pushed uh, outside by, uh, so it was kind of scary, and I was a very, still a very devoted Baptist girl. Uh, so it, it was very interesting, but it uh, got in my mind to go to University of Oklahoma and study journalism. And my dad told me um, that that's not a place for our people. You need to go to a teacher's college. No, I've got to go to the University of Oklahoma. So I lasted a year there. It really was, I was completely uh, over my head. Um, I, it was, uh, you know, fraternity, sorority, the big red, you know, football team. I've never seen a football game before. We didn't have enough boys for a football team school. And so I, um, I got married and, um, and married into a family of union carpenters, which was a great blessing. Um, and they, they were also, my father-in-law was a... Um, a uh, real civil rights activist, he, um, he almost single-handedly um, integrated the Carpenters Union um, in Oklahoma. This was like 1957, uh, 58, 56. Well, it already happened when I met my uh, husband-to-be, uh, so 54, 55. So we always had a lot of union people there, and I was learning about unions and that whole history. Um, they were all kind of New Deal, uh, New Deal Democrats, um, and um, uh, that was hard for me to reconcile because my dad really did not like the New Deal. He, he said it was to save the capitalists, and you know he was really right, but <laughs> it was better than you know what we have now. But um, it, he had to work for the WPA. You know, there were no farms to, and he was humiliated, digging ditches. He said he was very humiliated doing that, that work. So I had a very different view of the New Deal than that rosy thing, you know, that, that, that people tend to have. But I did really respect these people, and I, I learned a lot from them. And um, I also, they had... Um, my husband had friends uh, who were Middle Eastern. He was an engineering student, so the petroleum engineering students, many of them were from the Middle East. So I met a Palestinian who told me about Palestine about 10 years after the NAFTA. And um, I met uh, Syrians and you know, other, other Middle Eastern students. So I became kind of internationalized in my, in my scope. And it was, so three years, I did not, uh, I, I worked and sent my husband to finish his degree. And then we were going to move to San Francisco and find the Beatniks. So we did that in 1916. The Beatniks had all dispersed, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, it was, you know, it was a whole new world in San Francisco State uh, College. Uh, so that... Um, that's really the kind of, you know, peace work that brought me to be an activist. But I was very lucky. I don't know what would have happened had there not been a gigantic movement building, the civil rights movement. Um, could see on television uh, all the time, you know, these uh, um, sit-ins in the South and uh, the police uh, sheriffs beating up uh, crowds of people. and um, then the student activism really started um, 
it wasn't all that active when I uh, was at San Francisco State, but it was beginning, you know, beginning to happen. And then I, um, I fell in love with history, uh, one history course, and decided that's that was my major. And um, I had some good mentors. I I tell people, younger people, it's really mystifying to a lot of younger people that I, from after after grade school. I never had uh, all of my teachers and professors up to the PhD were white males. And um, so that was, you know, my mentors were all men at San Francisco State because there were no women professors. <laughs> and uh, so that was, there were in some fields and, you know, music and all, but certainly not in history. And, so I, um, I got persuaded to go to UC Berkeley uh, to be a graduate student. Uh, it hadn't been my plan, really, but it was handed to me. Fortunately, the universities were all free at that time. So I, um, I went to Berkeley for a year, and um, uh, it was very European-oriented. Um, the university system in California had been designed in the 1950s to specialize their different graduate schools. And so I decided I wanted to do Latin American history. I took a trip to Mexico and I, I just I said, I have to understand something. I got interested in imperialism you know, when I was an undergraduate. And um, it was very kind of staid uh, European. It was interesting. I mean, I, I took, I learned all about the, uh, the Junker class in Germany and brought that up to uh, eventually to um, Nazism and had German professors from Germany. It was, you know, very, very uh, rich, but it just wasn't what I was interested in pursuing. So I, I transferred to UCLA. I left my husband uh, along the way. We married too young, and he became very much an engineer and really resented uh, me, you know, my pursuit. I was supposed to be a housewife, and so I, I went to UCLA uh, and did Latin American history. I wanted to learn about imperialism. This is right after the, you know, soon after the Cuban Revolution. Um, and so everything was kind of centered on that. And it wasn't a very radical um, program, but um, it was so obvious just studying the history, you know, that we had to talk about imperialism all the time because that's, that's what was going on, U.S. imperialism in Latin America. And so that um, then, you know, 64 to 68 is where I really became active politically um, against the Vietnam. Vietnam War. Uh, we had a VA hospital right next door to um, uh, UCLA. And actually, you know, there's a, a lot of um, Ken Burns kind of lies about the, um, uh, about the anti-war movement. There was no spinning on returnees. There were none of that um, is true, and what we did was form actually a group of people to go, and uh, it was is really growth. Um, these the kinds of wounds, you know. I mean, so many paraplegics or people with nothing but um, head and torso, and they would hang them out on like clotheslines, you know, and um, to sun to get some sun. So we would go talk with them and actually write letters. Um, to their relatives and all, and uh, learn about what went on there from them. So I met a lot of um, returnees. It was the major hospital, I think, at that time for, for the um, horribly uh, damaged uh, people. So I think it, it really went deep in our group, which was very small. We started a, um, we started a uh, vigil in, 1965, and there were only six of us, me and my, and my good partner, and uh, another couple we knew, and the guy who organized was a philosophy professor, a radical philosophy professor. And it, by 1967, 
that vigil had uh, gone all the way down in I don't know UCLA probably, but Westwood and around the federal building and circle and came back up on campus. So just seeing that, you know, that kind of, um, I think that's what's different about movements now. It's very hard to see uh, success, you know, and actually building a movement. Um, uh, so that that's kind of my, uh, you know, I, I I didn't finish my PhD. I revolted. I said I don't want any more. We started losing some of our battles, um, and uh, I got disgusted with everything and took off. And for five years, was just a full time militant. Went underground for a while, and, um, and um, then did decide to go back and uh, finish my dissertation. That's all I lacked. So I wrote my dissertation and started teaching. Um, so that's my. Uh, then the Native American movement is what I um, what really propelled me um, in um, 1970-71 is when I actually I had um, should back up because I I got interested in ethnic studies because. Was a um, history professor was hired, Ron Takaki. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he is basically the founder of ethnic studies. He's a Japanese Hawaiian working class guy. Um, uh, they were pineapple workers, his family. And uh, so he wasn't, his family wasn't relocated because they didn't do, do that to the Hawaiian uh, Japanese, but he. Um, he got his PhD in history at UC Berkeley, and he taught the first, he did African, African American history, the first course taught at UCLA in African American history in 1966. And I volunteered to be his teaching assistant, even though it was in US. By then I was a senior graduate student. I had passed my exams, all I had was a dissertation, so I had first choice of who I wanted to TA for. And I said, I want Ron. And um, so your prestige as a TA went along with the prestige of your professor. And he was only an assistant professor uh, in his first year. I didn't care. I wanted to learn what he knew. So in the first class, about 500 students uh, signed up for it. It was very popular. It was a very white campus at the time. But the front row was filled with these very militant looking African American men. And um, they they came to check out. You know, they heard about it, they came to check them out. And he passed. Uh, and then they asked uh, if uh, they could audit the class. So he did. Uh, he said, sure. And um, they were a great, really enriched the class, you know, bringing up things and, and all. Well, they fired Ron for that. <laughs> so he went to Berkeley and started ethnic studies. But that was where, that was the, um, <clears throat> that was a seed planted in me. And so I ended up, um, when I did, did, you know, go decide to go on the job market after I finished my dissertation, I took a job in Native American studies. And I had already <clears throat> gotten involved um, somewhat, you know, in the American Indian movement and then got more deeply involved. And living in San Jose, the San Jose AIM was very active. And um, so this was right after Wounded Knee. And um, there were a lot of criminal cases. So I got involved in the, um, as an expert witness uh, in some of the trials. And that's what led me, you know, the Great Sioux Nation was a <clears throat> documentation of um, one of those hearings to dismiss all the charges based on the Sioux Treaty. There were about 300 uh, misdemeanors and felonies. Um, and uh, so it covers a, a two-week uh, hearing, a federal court hearing in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1974. So then I was really deeply involved and out of that came the International um, Indian Treaty Council, uh, aimed for the International Indian Treaty Council. 
Council. So that is the main work I have done that got me involved in all kinds of uh, international human rights work, uh, especially with Central American refugees in, uh, in the 1980s, many of whom were indigenous peoples, the Mayans, especially about um, 200,000 Mayan refugees uh, in Mexico and other parts of the world. Uh, so that, um, that international work really expanded um, what, what I was doing and thinking about and writing on, and I pretty much devoted myself to. Um, uh, well, I wrote a book called um, Blood on the Border, uh, Memoir of the Conquer War. So this was mainly opposing the Conquer War in Nicaragua. And uh, so that was, we really lost, uh, we were lost very badly um, because uh, the United States was adamant, you know, to stop the Central American Revolution. And it's, it's really sad. Um, I think I, um, after a lot of successes um, in the movement, that was a real, you know, a wake up call that uh, this is the counter revolution that we're in now. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is. Um... This is really, I, I love backstories. You know, I guess maybe that's one of the reasons I got involved in history initially was that sort of narrative side. Um, I'm really glad you brought up AIM, the American Indian Movement. I was actually going to ask before you brought it up if that was, you know, just given the temporal kind of space, I was wondering if maybe that had an influence. And obviously it did. I, I grew up on Westerns. You know, I was very much partially raised by my grandfather great guy, New Deal Democrat, but you know, I mean, standard, uh, patriarchal sort of Wild West sense, you know, so I grew up on John Wayne, and you know, I was a weird little kid, so I remember one summer when I was maybe eight, I took every book, adult books, uh, about Custer and the little big horn out of the library in Staten Island, you know, so that was kind of my initial intro, but then uh, I got Somehow, I think it was through watching actually sort of a fictional movie called Thunderheart with uh, Val Kilmer. Wow. Uh, I, I got that's how I, I think that's how I first got exposed to the American Indian movement, Leonard Peltier, and read his book and just a bunch of stuff. So that, that was really eye opening for me because it was the first time, and I think I must have been in high school. So it was the first time I looked at things from sort of another angle and uh, in the old way of thinking that I had, uh, Native Americans disappear in 1890, right? They sort of disappear uh, with the closure of the frontier. You know, if you're an academic, it's the Turner thesis. If you're a lay person, it's Wounded Knee or whatever. Uh, same general timeline, but it was interesting. And I also thought it was fascinating the way you brought up uh, Central America. And because I think so many times uh, it's really seen as discrete. You know, there's American Indians and, and then that's it, right? And there's no connections to uh, Native Americans elsewhere. Uh, so I think it's fascinating that you've taken a look at indigenous history cross-border, right? And you, it seems like you did that well before it was academic chic to talk about borderlands and transnational history. Yeah, I think movements do that. You know, they take you places that you, that are far ahead of this, they were academic, uh, what becomes more popularized. So it, it's a, a great gift to be in movements. Um, not many people have that um, opportunity now, which is um, something we did have, you know, in, in my generation when I was young. Like I say, we, you know, it became clear the reversal um, and losing all the time um, that we have to figure out, you know, how to um, have a buoyant, buoyant movie because it is the best way to get an education. Everything I know about, um, I never studied um, uh, Native American cultures. I was not interested in anthropology. Um, I, I was interested in imperialism and how it worked. And everything I, learned, I have learned about Native Americans and indigenous peoples have been in the movement, not reading, not reading books. Um, well, there just weren't very many of them until Native scholars, you know, really started 
um, being produced. And there were, when I got my dissertation in 1974, there were three Native Americans with PhDs. There were only four Native American doctors. There were about 10 Native American lawyers. That's just, you know, it started from scratch. And so the Native American studies is really the most dynamic of the, um, of the different ethnic studies. Some have become kind of boring and, you know, academic, but Native American studies has retained that edge and it's still uh, how Native students and allies um, get politicized um, in, uh, by in academia because it is, uh, we just had the uh, 50th anniversary of the University of New Mexico Native American Studies. I directed that program for three years in the late 1970s. So I was uh, asked to be the keynote at it and um, all the past directors were there and um, uh, alumni and then current students and it just you know just being reminded of that and how it's still it's it's more militant now than it was even then and it was founded by the Kiva Club the students set it up by threatening to burn down the campus and that's how most of them were established in the first place <clears throat> so we don't have that kind of um permission, you know, that we gave ourselves at that time to, um, you know, to do uh, um, things. This is, we're talking on um, May 4th today, and of course, this is the anniversary of the Kent State um, Massacre, four students being killed by National Guard, um, protesting against the invasion of Cambodia, the invasion of Cambodia. So I think that was a real, that was a turning point. Um, it really did work, even though it was an uprising. I was driving across the country. I was actually on a speaking, you know, a movement speaking tour. And um, campuses were on fire. There were tanks on campuses. The University of New Mexico has tanks, and it was just fires all over. Every ROTC building, I think, had been burnt during, during those demonstrations. And, most of the universities closed for the semester, just closed, gave it over to the National Guard. In some cases, Army, it was the Army at the University of New Mexico. So just driving through these places, you know, where we were supposed to speak and had been rearranged to speak off campus. It was, and so it was, it seemed successful, but I think it, it had the desired effect <clears throat> from the, you know, from the government of um, quelling, you know, for new people coming in, that's a lot to ask of them. Okay, you're going to get killed. You know, you have to worry about this. You're going to get killed. They think twice, you know, about <clears throat> just jumping in. So that was really the um, uh, marker, I think. And then, of course, a week later, uh, same thing happened in all black universities. Uh, college um, in Mississippi, Jackson State, killed three, three students uh, who were protesting the war. So it, um, you know, it was, it really did um, uh, cool down things. And of course, the, um, the Reagan, you know, the rise of Reagan in California already, it already had him for eight years when he became president. And um, that was, you know, he, his view was, I don't have a direct quote, but Santa Barbara, when he sent in the uh, National Guard, uh, he said, uh, there may be a lot of dead bodies, but so be it. Yeah. It really is striking. And I'm going to ask you a little more about Reagan and Central America later. Uh, it, it's it's interesting that you mentioned how in the short run, it seemed that the protest movement had so much power, but maybe in the long run, the shootings at Kent State and the other repression and Jackson State, which is forgotten, uh, you know, had this quelling effect. Uh, I think that that has really maintained itself. You know, uh, I'm here at the University of Kansas, uh, which is in Lawrence. It's kind of this 
you know, for those who don't know, it's, it's kind of this like liberal or today, you know, hipster oasis in, in, in red Kansas. And in 1970, you know, after Kent state, this place was on fire too, right in the middle of Kansas, you know, I mean, the national guard was here. There was shootouts. I mean, there was shots fired. They shut the campus. There was a citywide curfew. And then when we, conducted another illegal action similar to Cambodia, not as intense, of course, where we, you know, assassinated Qasem Soleimani of Iran. You know, I was keynoting a rally out downtown four blocks from the university and we had 11 students, you know, total. And so, yeah, I think it's, it it is a shame. I think the draft has something to do with that, though not everything. And uh, it's a tough thing, but, you know, let me have one more follow-up before I turn it over to my co-hosts. Um, and it, on this Native American issue, you know, and I want to ask you about teaching. Uh, you know, as you may know, for a time I taught U.S. history to freshmen or what we call plebes at West Point, uh, contrary to what a lot of folks out there might tend to think. And I've said this a few times on the pod, the military academy for its legion of flaws uh, is a real university as much as it is an automaton, you know, indoctrination center. Uh, for example, you know, to give a little bit of West Point faculty inside baseball, you know, the history in the English departments, for example, were considered and even pejoratively labeled hippies, you know, by the staff from the other subject areas, you know, and frankly, there really are sort of liberal active duty army officers in the history department. there, not as radical as maybe me and certainly not as, you know, definitely army rather than real world liberal, but still a fairly remarkable thing. Um, you know, that said, uh, I think it would genuinely shock some folks out there to know the sort of progressive and somewhat cutting edge. You know, I was just out of grad school, so cutting edge, historiographically speaking, material that, you know, I myself presented in the classroom. But all that aside, the syllabus, the day by day subject lesson plan, uh, was still set in stone for the American History 101 course that I first taught, which is probably very similar to what's out there across the country. Uh, there were only 40 lessons and we had to do, this might be different from other universities, we had to do all of American history in a single semester to teach the breadth of that history. So when you take into account day one sort of housekeeping and a couple of test dates, there were really only 35 or 36 teaching days. So as such, the course began essentially with Jamestown and ended with Obama's election in 2008. Uh, consequently, two things resulted, I think. One, uh, a vast temporal history of pre-1607 indigenous peoples, and, and even early Spanish colonization was erased. And two, though most of us made a genuine effort to include their voices and agency, Native Americans really only turn up in sort of cameo roles sprinkled you know throughout certain what we would say quote relevant lessons so that's a long lead up to what i think are a couple of difficult questions for you you know first uh what precisely is lost in this teaching formula which i think is still pretty vast and widespread and two you know how would you recommend handling the subject uh, of indigenous agency and voices you know from a pedagogical standpoint in these required courses you know where there's it's a survey and there's limited space. How, how do we do it? What's the best approach? Well, really good questions. Of course, every, the truth is lost, of course. <laughs> That's really what, what is lost. And you're right, even, um, even Howard Zinn's wonderful um, uh, paradigm shifting book, which was published in 1980, is extraordinary. It's never been really accepted as too radical for most historians. Um, but even Howard, and he was a friend of mine, and I um, often talk with him about it, that um, that he gets to the 1890 or Turner, you know, the um, Wounded Knee Massacre. And up until that time, it's very good, except during the Civil War, uh, where Native Americans just disappear, uh, even though there was the Sand Creek Massacre, the Dakota um, of mass execution, uh, the Navajo forced relocation to Carson made an army captain to, to and half of them died, in a, you know, in a desert um, concentration camp. Um, that never is mentioned in any of the Civil War material that, that's taught. Uh, so he made that mistake too, but he was very, very good on the initial genocide. And um, the and kept that up, 
um, pretty much after Andrew Jackson, he focuses on, you know, on removal. Um, and then he gets to the plains, it's very, very thorough. And after that, there's nothing, you know, until the current, you know, his last chapter, which he kept adding to, but the last chapter, which was the, the movements of Black Power, Red Power, Chicano Power, Women's Liberation, um, Civil Rights Movement, everything, you know, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And um, so I would ask him, you know, well, what happened to them? You know, what happened to the Indians? Were they, were they hibernating or, you know, what? Uh, it, makes, it makes it seem like they were all died off and then they were resurrected, you know, at Alcatraz. And he said, you know, I don't know how to write that history. He, he said that very sincerely and, um, and kept encouraging me to. So when, you know, he had published his book with Beacon Press and um, um, I got a call from Beacon Press in 2008 and oh, this wonderful editor um, said she was doing a revisioning American history series and wanted um, Native American history of the United States to be the first volume and that Howard Zinn had select had um, had suggested that I be you know I would be the person to write it so I said oh well sure I'll write that that's easy and of course it took me um, six years it was uh, very very difficult to write even for me, even though I knew it all, and well, to put it in 300 pages and, um, you know, go back up to 50,000 years in the history of Native people in the Western Hemisphere and great civilizations. And so I, you know, it, it, it really was a, a lot of work, but it was, I didn't have to do any research. I mean, everything is known. This is what is incredible. Everything is already known. There's no secret document. There's no, it's, it's purposeful to, um, because it's, it's, you know, that inconvenient truth that the U.S. narrative, it can, multiculturalism shifted it somewhat, but, um, actually, the elements of the narrative, um, uh, of the founding narrative, the founding fathers, and, uh, you know, they're imperfect, you know, now it's what they call warts and all, no more polishing, and even though that's not really true, they still do that, you know, that um, uh, deification of the founders, but Teachers mostly have materials where they say this is flawed, there were flaws, but it's like, you know, the Lincoln thing, the more perfect union has to be formed. There are these errors and mistakes, but not getting to fundamental questions like what does effect of genocide have on the people who commit it and, and their and their progeny? And it's left out, you know, completely. Um, what does uh, what does it do, you know, to 20th century history between 1890 and, and 1960s um, to not even deal with um, these, you know, these almost abandoned reservations and um, still today Native Americans on reservations lifespan is 47 years you know it's just incredible it's just it's still um the situation and that there was a termination act in 1953 to terminate all native americans and it's not in you know it's not in any lesson plans or what does that say about the united states that right when you know and one of their excuses for allotting Native land in the 1880s, uh, the Dawes Act. Uh, Senator Dawes said, you know, that um, greed is the basis of civilization. And these people living communally, they will never, uh, they will never do well and, until they learn to be selfish and, um, you know, and have private property. 
and that was in 1880s. But they were saying the same thing with the Termination Act. You know, it's communist. You know, these people are living communally. And even on the left, you know, there's this. Um, there, it also doesn't fit the working class. You know, the the, the proletariat model of the revolution. Um, it, it and and so they ignore what settler colonialism is and what it does to the mentality that everyone wants to be a king and rich and they certainly don't want to call themselves working class <laughs> they call themselves middle class and ask for aspiring um, so all of these things being left out is just um, damaging every generation of children I think but I feel kind of hopeful. Um, an Indigenous People's History of the United States came out in a Young People's Edition last July. And although our, you know, our um, work on it, uh, going around educators and teachers and all, has been cut short with the with the stay at home, um, we've continued, you know, a lot of it online. But it's very exciting. Um, I had, uh, I persuaded a um, native woman from Nembe Pueblo in New Mexico, Debbie Reese, to do the ad adaptation. I knew she was the perfect person. She, um, she does a, um, uh, she has a project, uh, she's run for about 10 years now, maybe 15, of uh, analyzing every children and young people's book that comes out for what is its, uh, what, how does it deal with American Indians, called American Indians in children's literature. And uh, she critiques it. She has become the go-to person for librarians and teachers for uh, elementary and junior high and high school um, books uh, and for regular people who don't want to damage their children, but, you know, think it's, you know, and, the Indian in the cupboard is a nice little story, you know, for children. And so that, I knew she was the perfect person to adapt it. And it's, it's an absolutely wonderful book. And it won every award. This is why I'm encouraged. It, it doesn't water down my thesis at all. Nothing in it is watered down. It's simply refashioned, you know, with lots of things and, and blocks and summaries of things and questions asked, but everything is there, it's intact, and teachers are hungry for it. It's just, it, and parents, it's just, it really, it really encourages me that the, um, the desire is there, and I was invited to um, the American Indian Museum uh, in the Bowery in New York, um, uh, not, not the newer one in D.C., and um, invited me. They had one in D.C., but Debbie did that one, and I did the one in New York. Every year, they, they bring teachers together, two, two 3,000 teachers locally, you know, from New England and New York area, New Jersey, uh, to um, um, learn new curriculum, to have, you know, a, really a week-long intensive thing. So they brought me as a keynote speaker. I spoke to like 3,000 um, educators at every, you know, young people down to K to 12 um, teachers. And um, some of them charter schools, some of them public schools. And I, I couldn't believe, you know, the reception. For one thing, the book was, you know, was required reading before they came and how enthusiastic they were. So I, I it's too bad that, you know, universities, um, usually you think you get out of the, uh, you know, kind of prison of, um, the usual patriotic stuff and all you have to go through in public schools. And then you get to university and there's all this critical thinking and you can read Marx and, you know, you find all kinds of, of new things, but no, not with them. Uh, even as hard as I work in at my little university, um, Cal State University, my whole career there, I don't feel like I ever got through the, to the history department, you know. Um, 
they um, the only thing other departments would do is try to because our courses were so popular uh, and there was a required course in cultural groups a very general thing and a lot of uh, a lot of things outside of our ethnic studies um, qualified for that uh, but we always had the best and it's still true you know the the, the best uh, percentage of students taking the classes and um, so they would sometimes try to kind of steal one of our our classes but then not have not bring a native person in to teach it um, they still only have one Native American uh, teaching um, uh, Native American studies there so this is um, uh, it's it's a little different, like I say, at University of New Mexico, they've made a much bigger impact because they it's a very densely native uh, area. Uh, the Navajo Nation is the largest nation, and some students who go to higher education go to University of Arizona or Arizona State, um, but many, many come to University of New Mexico, and especially since Native American Studies has been established, so they have about 3,000 Native American students and that's a you know a big critical mass they have a huge effect on the whole campus and but the those are specific spots i would say upset upstate new york the sunnis um the haudenosaunee have been very good about uh, imposing themselves without invitation to uh, uh be a part of the curriculum since it's their territory <laughs> And they are pretty powerful people. Um, so I find people really conscious there and you can't really avoid it. But most of the country, including Oklahoma, where I come from, which has you know the second largest native population, 50 different native nations, that was the relocation you know, place in the, um, in the territory. So 50 different native peoples from east of the Mississippi who were forced there, plus the Plains people who were already there at the Osage, and, um, Caddo and, and the um, uh, others relocated there, the Cheyenne and Comanche. Um, so it's, it's difficult there. They actually do have a governor now who's Cherokee and he's just horrible. He's a right-wing Republican. <laughs> Uh, so universities, though, should really be shamed for not um, uh, doing better in, in history. In history, as you know, being, uh, you know, having gone through a PhD in history and teaching in history, are the, the most conservative. I was told at UCLA, one of the, you know, taking Latin American history, one of my fields of study had to be Spain and Spanish imperialism. And I had one of the top, Stanley Payne, his name, uh, one of the top um, scholars in that in Spanish history uh, outside of Spain, um, who wrote mostly about uh, you know the 20th century, but he was very knowledgeable about everything. I learned tons from him. But he told me my first meeting with him, because he would be on my doctoral committee, um, that he did not think that women should be able to um, major in history or do a doctorate in history. So he just wanted me to know that. <laughs> so, whoa, well, that, that's uh, nice. Okay. And he really, when he gave the reading list to me for my um, oral dissertation, he had 3,000 books on there. He had 3,000 books, most of them in French, Portuguese, and Spanish. <laughs> And um, no way he could master it. He did everything he could, you know, to, um, um, you know, to get rid of me. And there were only four women in that department. Of um, they had six hundred history graduate students at UCLA. Four women. So it was, and and one Chicano, two Chicanos, uh, one African American. Uh, at that time. So there is, you know, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of integration of 
women's history and black history into um, history field, but um, not not Native American history. It just changes the whole narrative of U.S. history if you, unless you really, you know, really tinker with it in ways that, of course, is done. Um, but um, I don't know um, how we're going to deal with it at the university level. Um, as more and more Native um, Native Americans, the, the history field is very hostile to Native American. Uh, I think in my case, it's in the pain is that I was a woman. But um, graduate students at the University of Oklahoma have been, um, uh, one was telling me why she dropped out, that she went in her first day um, to, after she was accepted, she wanted to major in history. And in front of the whole group of new graduate students um, in history, the professor um, told her that uh, you have to, under she's very, obviously native she's cherokee but she's you know very very dark she's a very traditional cherokee family and you know, spoke cherokee fluently you would think this would be a prize student you know and he said you have to um, know one thing is you can't be a historian and be an indian you have to choose which you're going to be so that's not very welcoming you know, for um, Native Americans to go into history. A few have, but they tend to go into uh, one of the the best known um, Native American historians is Jennifer Denta Valley, who's a Dine novel. Um, from a very traditional family, but she was uh, brilliant and got her PhD at UNM, and then um, they really, really. Uh, wanted her in the history department, but she felt so alienated there that she actually quit and went to Flagstaff to the, um, uh, to the state university there, which is, you know, majority not the whole student. And uh, so she actually stepped down, you know, um, within the first couple of years of her uh, teaching career. And then she went to, um, she got recruited to, America, uh, to Arizona State University, uh, which had a pretty good, you know, has, should be better, being right in the heart of Navajo Nation. Um, but she was very alienated there too. So she got recruited back to UNM. History said they understood, you know, why alienation. They offered her more things. They really needed a Native person. And she finally transferred to American studies. So um, it's very hard to get Native Americans to scholars. They're in English, they're in uh, um, more and more in anthropology that has improved and in uh, uh, American studies. Um, but um, history is just is still, uh, I don't know, what What do you think is a problem with history? I see it as, uh, you know, having this this European basis, this very Eurocentric basis as it's, um, you know, in the historiography and thinking that history is a, um, you know, a classic uh, field that's absolutely necessary. And um, that, that in practice, it means, uh, different nations mean that they are what I call the keepers of the secrets rather than because they know all this stuff. I know they know. They're not ignorant. You know, they do know it. <laughs> but it's not good for the, uh, you know, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Uh, they all really think this, but he said it. It's history should be, U.S. history should be civics. Right. That was the whole consensus historian shtick. Uh... <laughs> For sure. So uh, I'm going to shut up uh, finally for a minute and uh, turn things over to Kagan for a moment. And then, uh, yeah, I think he, he's got a little bit more to ask you about some present Native American stuff, and we'll kind of go from there. Great. Thank you, Danny. 
The guys and I love doing the podcast. Being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us. But we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with someone, anyone, whom you might think could be affected by it. A young person looking to join the military or possibly parents advocating for a kid joining the military. Conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name. Advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military creates for my minorities and inflicts on those same minorities across the globe. And anyone else you think might be affected by it. Please take a moment, share this with them. Now, our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer of the podcast, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, You can help keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out these honorary producers, and they are Will Arenz, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Emma P, Janet Hansen, Lawrence Taylor, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt.com for some great Fortress merch. And do understand that if you can't afford to contribute to us, that doesn't bother us at all. This is a hard time for everybody, and we just want to make sure that what we share gets to as many people as possible. And now, let's get back to the podcast. So... Just to kind of round out my question, um, my grandfather is Umatilla, and I didn't really know him that well, but like I, like I live in Portland now, so I'm like a little closer to the reservation, and I work in social work, so I work with a lot of Native American people right now, um, with Native American veterans. Um, and I, I grew up with, like my family taught me a bunch of different folk stories from a bunch of different cultures, and so I grew up with this uh, mindset of like a story is a story and it's a good one. And, you know, so why not learn about everything? And it was nice because my parents really encouraged me to learn a lot more about native people's history in America. So while I was getting one side in school, I was learning another side of my own and all about the the various different tribes out there and what they're doing and what they have done. And just, it was really nice to like, get that other perspective other than that white European uh, Eurocentric viewpoint that we only get in U.S. history. And I took a Native American cultures class my freshman year of college at this small liberal arts school in Illinois. And I, uh, the first thing the teacher says is write down everything you know about Native Americans. And so I just like go off and I start writing about the Eastern Woodland tribes and the Great Plains tribes in the Southwest and just like the stuff that I knew. And I looked over and I wondered, you know, what other people were writing because most people were done after like four or five minutes. (laughs) And I, uh, (laughs) we go through the class, you know, and everyone is sharing their answers. And most people just said that all I know is the stereotypes. I know that they drink a lot and they own casinos. And I was just like, oh, and, So at the end of the class, we all had to pick a tribe to talk about and talk about their history and, you know, to now everything that's they're facing now. And it was really cool to hear um, this was more than just a freshman class. So there was sophomores, juniors and seniors in my class. And I had kids who were juniors 
at the end of the class being like, I can't believe I've gone through school for 14 years and I'm just learning about this now. And I found that so like frustrating, but also like, uh, it was cool that like, I'm, I'm glad that at least people are learning this in this class. That's not very big, but at least like some people are taking the time time to learn about it. So, um, I just wanted to know, I, I've been reading about how Native Americans uh, communities are trying to deal with the virus, um, but I just wanted to know if you could expand a little bit for our listeners what the response looks like, and also um, later on, I just wanted to talk about the federal response, but for now, can you talk about what the, how certain communities are responding? Well, of course, it's really troublesome because the... Um that first stimulus package, um, I heard the uh, Dr. Uh, Burks actually say at the press conference that the first, um, it was like uh, $2 billion was earmarked for Native American reservations and in urban areas. And um, that's how they're supposed to do things. That's really, you know, through the treaties and all agreements and everything. The um, uh, and the Indian Health Service, I'm sure, had um, had lobbied for that, and the Native, of course, the National Congress of American Indians. But to this day, that was in that was in late March. To this day, there's zero zero federal that has gone to any Native group anywhere. It's just, um, it's scandalous, but it's, um, so they've had to fend for themselves. And um, as you know, the, um, the reservations are purposely um, uh, kept in conditions um, in which most people have to leave to go work and send money back as almost like little third world countries uh, with remittances coming back. So half the population, mostly young people, live um, away and uh, not always in great conditions either. Um, but that means the most vulnerable people are left at the reservation. Uh, the rate of diabetes is um, is just skyrocketing because of the horrible kinds of um, uh, food that is available in you know in these places to the general population. I'm sure um, the white people in South Dakota also have a high diabetes problem. You know, white flour, white um, sugar, fat, and and um, uh, and white everything. You know. Um, and a lot of these are commodities from the government, you know, processed cheese and, and, and white flour, white rice. Um, and, and of course, you know, there is a, um, alcohol we can talk about that. I see it as a, um, um, uh, like uh, the anthropologist Nancy Lurie, uh, who is excellent, you know, uh, one of the few anthropologists who, really got it. Uh, she saw Indian drinking as a, um, the longest protest demonstration in, in history, that it was a way of, um, of rebelling. And I, I've seen that myself, how quickly, um, you know, alcoholism is a disease, it's addictive and it's not hard to, but uh, an awful lot of Native Americans are not really alcoholic. They drink, but they're not alcoholic and they can quit. I saw it with wounded knees, suddenly everyone down in the tenderloin, all the native people, they were up in the American Indian Center, which you couldn't enter if you were drinking or, or drunk. It's cold sober and packing blankets and all the thing back to wounded knees. So, but nevertheless, a lot of alcohol is consumed and cheap alcohol. And uh, diabetes is, is this, and, and other diseases um, uh, lower the, the um, lifespan of men to 47 and women to 52. Uh, they don't even live long enough to get social security. You know? so, it's, uh, so in these kinds of conditions and in crowded places, um, 
the you know the health centers and all are very ill-equipped. Um, some have maybe six beds or twelve beds, and one ICU unit. They have to um, fly people out to hospitals, and um, anyone who's a vet, a native vet, uh, will always choose veterans. Uh, care over the Indian Health Service because it's much better funded, much better care. So the the situation, especially in the um, uh, Navajo Nation, is is pretty grim. Um, I try to keep up with it every day. Um, the yesterday or over the weekend, a 28 year young young woman. Uh, Navajo, who's Miss Navajo, and is totally healthy, she's athletic, and uh, she died. She um, she suddenly fell sick, and six hours later, she died. And um, so that was a uh, that was a shock. She's from the Red House family, and who knows how many pe people live very do live very communally. Um, in a hogan, um, might be twelve people. You know, twelve people live uh, there, or if it's HUD housing, still, you know, um, people live communally on extended families or extended family units being together all the time. The uh, it's very hard to have the social distancing and to um, just have the space to have uh, social distancing. So the spread is just, um, is really uh, great. Um, so I, um, there are a few other places that have been hard to hit. The Pueblo of Zia in New Mexico was, had the first cases of virus. Um, one problem with the Pueblos is that the, um, uh, the people are, you know, tourists are so fascinated, local tourists and, and around the country and the world because they're so tr traditional and still have their their apartment stored, you know, the oldest city-states um, in North America and still practice their their religion in Kivas underground and have many ceremonial days and feasts a year. So they ca have a constant tourism come in and it's become a part of their income you know, for their welfare um, and schools and their language programs and all. So they, they close their gate, put up signs, no visitors, and people were still coming in. So that, um, I think, has been uh, leveled off, but it's still a lot of people sick and a lot of people had to be taken out to um, Albuquerque and to other hospitals away from their families have to be seen. And I'm not sure about uh, Oregon. I don't think it's been as hard hit, all the reservations there. And Washington, they got a handle on things pretty quickly in, in Washington and were hit early. So I don't think it, it got out so much um, to the reservations, although I think quite a few of the native people in Seattle um, had, had the virus that I know of. Uh, so it's, you know, it, this lack of any kind of federal funds, and of course, Donald Trump hates Native Americans because he thinks um, the casinos made his own casino go broke. He has to blame Indians or China or anything for anything he feels at. So um, they can I, I guess, cannot really expect, uh, and there's so little representation in um, uh in Congress, uh, there is, you know, the, there are three uh, Native people now, and, and but the Democrats don't have much sway since none of them are in the Senate. And so there's really not a, um, a strong voice. The National Congress, American Indians, you know, have really been on it, and they send out, I'm on, you know, I'm on the, the email list, and um, I, they, they give the tallies and keep warning um, 
and I, I know that up across the border and you know the at the um, uh, Micmacs have been pretty hard hit. Of course, there was that uh, mass shooting up there, 22 people killed, um, that, and quite a few of them were, were Native people, and, and they were just sitting ducks, you know, being in, um, in uh, sequestered because of the virus. So has the government given any response as to why there is no money or where it is? Because I'm sure people are asking, but it's just really frustrating that this has been in the news for a bit now, and people, like, there's still no response as to why they haven't given the money or what the holdup is. No, it's just, um, but, you know, after, I don't know, now 50 years of, um, of um, experiencing the federal government, you know, and being observant of the federal government's uh, behavior um, toward Native people, it, it, it's always an enigma, you know, these, even the, um, I mean, there was finally a lawsuit, you know, that uh, billions and billions of dollars that the federal government had uh, had um, um, cheated. Um, the, all the all the people who were on allotments, uh, there that were under trust, but they um, so the government was supposed to be handling all those funds and were not. Um, so, and, and the American Indian Movement uh, uh, march on Washington in, in uh, the fall of 1972, um, they took over the Bureau of Indian Affairs. At that time, nothing was computerized, but they took out, uh, they were in there for five days. So they started reading everything and then they boxed everything up and took it out. And that's actually what they went to present to the United Nations that the um, First meeting, they brought those boxes of, of materials, uh, uh, just you know, incredible malfeasance and corruption in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, so it hasn't, you know, it's been somewhat indigenized um, uh, with the Red Power movement, um, but there's, it's never been um, that. Um, uh, it, it, it got somewhat better in the 80s and, and the 90s. The Clinton administration was not bad. Um, they had they were good friends, the Clintons, with Wilma Mankiller, who was the president of the Cherokee Nation, very prominent person. And uh, but with since 9/11, and you know where everything goes to so-called national security. And just the the gutting of look look at the CDC, you know, it's useless. Yeah, it's just totally gutted. I knew that from you know doing the research on 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 guns, um, where any funds looking into the health um, aspect of uh, of um, gun violence was was cut from the CDC. And then I looked, just started reading further, you know, a couple of years ago, and everything was being gutted at CDC. So these, you know, all of these, and then, you know, just the the um, the billions and billions of um, uh, that go to the um, defense budget has all the universities now, uh, the only way they can get grants is through the Defense Department. So everything is getting militarized and and then they're not going to give any of that money away apparently. Um, so it's just, uh, I guess, you know, the, um, the pipeline uh, to the reservations have been so cut off and there's, and, and, and reservation, you know, Native people have come to be more self-sufficient with the casinos. They've been able to build roads and schools and language programs. And um, but they um, they can't, you know, even with casino money and the, and only, you know, only the the places that have a big tourist attraction, like in New Mexico or Southern California. Uh, or New England really 
benefit that much uh, to do some big projects, but they can't build whole health systems. And that's what the Indian Health Service is there for. That was um, an institution that was guaranteed by, by treaties that were made that in exchange for land sessions, they had certain social services that would be provided in perpetuity forever and ever. It would be a responsibility of the federal government. But it's so minimal that um, they do the best they can. Um, I've met so many of the doctors and nurses um, working in those rather remote places under conditions, but with a with a with a crisis like this, they really are totally helpless. So, if uh, noting all the the problems that you mentioned, um, I just wanted to ask if you were a benevolent dictator, what what uh, steps would you take to kind of start to rectify some of these issues? Well, the first thing is to uh, transfer all of public lands, so-called public lands, lands held by federal government and state back to their, their um, owners, you know, whatever tribe uh, they belong to when they were taken illegally without treaty. That's why the federal government, you know, there's all this pressure to um, from these uh, Mormon ranchers and you know, the guys with guns at Malheur and all. Um, <clears throat> why, you know, they, they don't respond to them and privatize, I mean, they lease, but they cannot sell federal land under their own laws because there's no treaty. They don't own it. They don't really own it. They just possess it. So they can't sell it. And it should be returned, including a national park. You know, and this should be a main call for all social justice activists in the United States is return the land. And, um, and then to, um, to create a proper um, self-determination, um, you know, a vote just like the um, Samoa or Guam or, or uh, Puerto Rico have the right to vote whether they have independence or some, some state of autonomy in relationship or commonwealth. And those, kind of, those are the big things that have to be done for it ever to change and for make people to be able to really, um, to, to flourish as, you know, as civilizations. And I think it's in the interest of all people in the United States that they be able to see how people who work collectively and um, here, here are people who own casinos, but they own them collectively. And they use that casino move, uh, the casino money for public housing, for schools. It doesn't go into anyone's personal pocket. And I think there's one Native American millionaire guy who started some, he's a Chicago guy who started some uh, um, roadside on Route 66, some, you know, place to stop in there. Not Stuckey's, but something like that. I met him a few years ago. <laughs> he's the only Native American billionaire. It's, there's, the, the cultures are so strong, you know, and, and, and definitely shattered in many ways, but some of the elements of, of respecting the land and being a part of the um, animal world and plant world, I mean, being a cognizant of that is, are things that people need to learn if we're going to save the planet. And so this native knowledge is being suppressed um, or squelched because of hardship. Um, it hurts everyone, you know, it's a, it's a resource that hurts everyone. So I know that's a big thing, but I, I think there's, there are no, there's no patchwork that can be done that will change the situation of 
settler colonialism still existing, you know, and, and colonialism and un, unadmitted to um, still um, still existing right here. And not and of course Puerto Rico and Guam would also like to be self determined and have they're in much the same position um, as the as, as native peoples and. So these colonies of the United States definitely need uh, uh, the decolonization is the only thing that will really change it. So I think this, um, um, in shorter term, I mean, with those is the, you know, like the overarching, those are the demands of Native people, the fundamental demands of Native people. Now, what step by step? How 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 do you get there? And um, this would take you know mass movement. Native people can't do it by themselves. Um, it would take uh, so that's one reason why the general education is so important. That once people learn this, they think, why would it be onerous for me to have to go to Grand Canyon and have it be completely controlled? Uh, by the Havasupai, whose land it is, rather than the National Park Service. Why, why would that be a uh, burden to me? Yeah, maybe during their ceremonies or something, they'll close the gates and say, no visitors, but um, they do that with the National Park Service too, like right now. So I think even, you know, recently I've been interacting a lot with the National Park Service people. I, I noted that in 2014, someone told me they saw my book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, in the National Park Service, um, you know, those little stores they run. And I didn't believe it. It was at Land's Inn in San Francisco. I went out there and there it was. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And then it turned up in Sacramento in a you know, national park service. So I then investigated and it, it, the whole national park service was stocking that book in their bookstores. So I thought, well, that's interesting. So then I got invited to um, meet with some park service people, the ones who do Alcatraz and uh, had the 50th anniversary last November um, and the Presidio and you know, the ones around here. And it was just before we had to go and lock down. We had this meeting down at the Presidio. And these young people, a couple of Native Americans themselves, there's about 40 of them, they are all for transferring. They know, you know, they actually know just from their work that these are Native American sacred sites that they are running themselves. And, and they want it to be restored. So that was an interesting, um, uh, an interesting uh, new thing that I, I simply was not aware of, you know, how the younger people who've been um, recruited to the National Park Service look like the military right now, you know, it's like, wow, they had different ideas than, than in the past. Um, so I know that sounds big, but we got to think big because the small things are not working. Hi, Roxanne. It's Henry. My uh, my 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 Hi. turn to shoot to to give you some questions here. So I, I'd like to start by reading a quote of yours discussing American gun ownership and its connections to America's history of settler colonialism. Quote: The violent appropriation of native land by white settlers was seen as an individual right in the Second Amendment. That long intergenerational violent struggle to take the land is why descendants of those mostly Anglo and Scots-Irish settlers today believe they are the authentic lords of the United States and should govern a quote, a, a kind of blood right. Um, a firearm slung over your shoulder or a nine millimeter Browning tucked under your belt creates a sense of amplified power without which you feel naked and vulnerable. Guns are awesome. They are also uh, beautiful objects that are addictive. So something we deal with here on the podcast is, is you know, not just the, the, the military's appetite for, for hardware, for weaponry, but 
the the civilian gun culture and how absolutely ingrained it is right now at this this point in our history. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your own experience with firearms and elaborate on the history of firearms as it pertains to the U.S., specifically concerning white supremacy and settler colonialism. Yeah. Uh, well, my own experience growing up, um, there were guns everywhere. They were certainly not the, um, well, there were a few at that time, you know, military style veterans to bring home, but um, they were mainly um, rifles, uh, 22 rifles, uh, deer, deer guns, and, um, and uh, shotguns. Very few um, sidearms, I remember. Many people didn't have, you know, expensive objects. People didn't have money for these things. But um, hunting, which I, I kind of, before I wrote Loaded um, uh, and did a lot of research on hunting, I was kind of already on to it in Indigenous Peoples History of the United States that hunting in the United States is a, um, uh, it, it's not just about hunting, you know, it's about uh, becoming uh, native and, you know, making that transfer, replacing like in the um, um, last of the Mohicans where the Indian hands over America to the white guy because, uh, well, we're dead and gone, you have it now. And that makes them really Native Americans. And so because they mythify Native people as, as hunters, uh, which isn't really true, 90% of Native people in the whole Western Hemisphere were farmers and fishermen, uh, not hunters. And um, they mythify then their own, you know, Daniel Boone. I grew up with um, hearing about Daniel Boone, uh, my mother. Claimed um, have some, you know, they came from Kentucky originally and had some uh, lineage. But then I found out that almost all got the Irish, and he was Welsh. But you know, the the those colonial settlers uh, on the land that kept moving. Um, he died in Missouri. You know, um, kept moving Kentucky to Missouri. That was the trek of both sides of my family, and. Um, the, my father's side is that I was Scots Irish Dunbar. Um, my dad used to say, but we were the bad kind of Irish. We were the black Irish. And I said, what does that mean? You know, and he says, well, we were the, you know, we didn't like the Irish Catholics. So <laughs> I, you know, he, he had been taught by his father that it's not a great thing to be proud of to be a Scots Irish. Um, but that, you know, that colonization of Ireland by, by um, uh, Puritan, um, uh, by the um, uh, Calvinist Protestants is, is still, a, a, you know, still a hot spot today and not settled a colonial situation. So those are the people who were the main um, settlers who um, were fighting for land, you know, that basically in the colonies, uh, settlers could take the land, drive the native people out, and red coats didn't have to be called in, or even the Virginia militia, or, you know, whatever, colonial militia. Um, it was just taken, and then it would be um, uh, ratified as, you know, part of the colony, and that's how they got to the Appalachians, and then they stopped. And they had to make a revolution to keep going because the British put a stop to it with the proclamation of 1763. But the Daniel Boone um, idea of him is that he was a fur trapper. He was a failed businessman. He, he never really made it, but he kept trying. And he was kind of typical of these, um, uh, of these families, you know, they kept moving, they kept losing their land. They would take it, they would do the killing. They would do the uh, keeping the native people out, and then some big planter would come and push them out, or they couldn't compete because they they didn't have cash 
uh, in order to buy enslaved Africans and compete. They couldn't compete with the plantations. So they either had to just raise food, to help feed, you know, for, for them to buy, just be dependent. The whole thing was plantation, agriculture, all the way up, even to New York, you know. Um, so they, um, the idea of, of going, you know, with Daniel Boone going into Kentucky, and he was a, he was a fur trader. They were killing all the beaver, you know, the beaver. But they didn't shoot them, they trapped them, you know, they laid traps and then they would come back. So the whole idea it was a business enterprise. Um, the deer skins as well, that's how buck, you know, buck for a dollar in eastern uh, western Pennsylvania, the they call it, deer skins were buck buck skins. And that's how the dollar became a buck because they, that was the currency. Uh, so it was all commercial, you know, it was just not, you know, there wasn't this peasantry living off the land. It was, it was completely commercial. So under the colonies, it had to be because they had to send, you know, send money back to the corporations that own the colonies and to the crown. But when it was independent, also, they, you know, it was, it was all commercial. So the, um, um, so anyway, I this hunter, you know, my brother's hunting and all the men in, in the area hunting, I thought was, I mean, we did eat the meat. My mother hated it. She would not even touch the wild meat. She was smart, I think, you know, not to. Um, <laughs> so what can happen? But my dad, would we eat squirrel and possum and uh, rabbits and, but, we didn't have to because we had chickens and we had some pigs, you know. I mean, we didn't really have to eat the wild meat. But I think my dad was infused, you know, with this idea. He had been a cowboy, actually a working cowboy on the 101 Ranch in Oklahoma, the biggest uh, commercial ranch on the Osage, in the Osage Nation. And I think he, you know, because he quit school and he um, became a cowboy and he always wore a cowboy hat and boots. And so even though he was poor and a sharecropper and all, he could have this mythical image of himself. And so he always took a you know rifle or shotgun or both with him anywhere he went, it was, you know, something, something to shoot. And it was a big, but it was a big um, trauma in my house. Most of the women also shot. They usually did target shooting. They didn't go hunting so much. Some of them did. But women also, you know, uh, like to be good with guns. Um, and my mother was the opposite. She was an orphan. She had a very, um, had a very tough childhood that I never, you know, she, she was in foster home. She was uh, uh, in a juvenile facility uh, that she could get out on weekends and that's how she met my father uh, but she really hated guns she was terrified of guns and it was there were always arguments about guns um, uh, as my brothers got older especially my oldest brother he was uh, 15 when I was four uh, was very volatile and very gun crazy and um, he didn't care to hunt basically it was you know just just target shooting and he went into the military after that um and was always into guns but it was a big fight all the time and so i, I think a kind of deal was made between my mother and father that um she got the girls and he got the boys um that we my sister and i were not to have anything to do with the gun. She also didn't like horses. She didn't like anything about any of that. <laughs> My dad had always had. He actually uh, raced quarter horses, and uh, uh, she didn't like dogs, and he liked dogs, hunting dogs, and so there was always this split. Um, but I pretty much took guns for granted completely, uh, and. Um, 
when I left, I didn't, the family I married into, they were, they didn't have guns at all. You know, they were urban people and they were union people and they didn't, I don't remember, but it, it could be they did and I just didn't even notice it, you know, because I was so used to guns being everywhere. Um, but then when I got, you know, uh, when we were, um, you know, what led to us going underground as a political group, was the repression, the New Orleans police, the FBI. Um, after some of us went to Cuba and came back, and um, the FBI put out things that we were trained there, which wasn't true, and they come back. You know, so there were hundreds of hundreds of uh, people who w went to Cuba, Cuba on these uh, work brigades, and no one was trained in arms or anything, but. Um, but this did, you know, bring the an excuse for, um, for um, uh, either trying to discredit us or even kill us or put us in prison. So our answer to it was, you know, to start getting guns to protect ourselves. Um, we even had the Ku Klux Klan um, uh, calling and threatening, you know, to firebomb the place and all. And there were also Cuban exiles who had terrorist groups at the time. So, so you've lived the the, the full spectrum of, of owning guns from starting off as a kid, going out shooting in the woods, later on seeing how cheap and abundant they are, being able to stockpile them easily, and having people misin misinterpret why you own them and what you might use them for. Yeah, I think it, you know, it did do some good to protect us. I, I mean, I, they were so, um, um, well, for one thing, Louisiana had no gun laws at all. The only laws, federal laws were interstate, you know, interstate commerce. There was no limit on how many guns you could have or how much ammunition of any kind. There were just, there was nothing on the book whatsoever so it was so easy to and that's how most of the states uh, Louisiana I think was the probably the the most um, gun friendly state at that time that's not why we moved there but it, it became a reason for staying and going underground there but um what was what was interesting to me after you know after a while, after a couple of years, is that we had become, you know, the guns tend to um, to bring attention to themselves all the time. You have, uh, as you know, you have to take care of them. You have to oil them. That's what I remember from my childhood is my dad and my older brother oiling and, and uh, cleaning and every day, you know, cleaning the guns, get the guns out and clean them and the smell of the oil and and um, it, that's, you know, it became more about the guns and also um, putting them in safe places. Uh, we even started reloading shotgun shells, but we, with you know, we got the gunpowder and actually a reloading machine. So yeah, um, but I I then um, I didn't really figure all that out until later. Actually, when I was asked to write the book um, on the Second Amendment, I did understand what the Second Amendment was about. But I hadn't thought to you know I would tell that story of my of what I, that chapter I call gun love. But I do think. The guns can can be addictive in a at least in our society where individuality is so uh, strong and demanded of people and every man for himself and you know hoard goods so you can take care of yourself um, that. The gun becomes then a um, necessary part of that for a sense of empowerment. And then it becomes um, kind of addictive. Um, it's just, 
You know, only 30% of the U.S. population owns even one gun, which is really interesting because, you know, most people in cities don't really own guns unless they're in a gang or something. Um, and that 30%, if you break it down, 67% um, uh, of them are white men. And uh, also 40% are veterans. And so you kind of, you know, have to look at it as, as a, not a general, I think a general social problem uh, or issue or fact, but this 30%, who are these, who, who are these 30%? And this is something I really got interested in um, exploring um, what, you know, this, this, um, Part of it comes from, you know, the what, early 20th century and onward um, uh, cowboys and Indians uh, movies and gunslinging. And then I have a chapter on the Confederate guerrillas, you know, which is really interesting because um, I grew up with, you know, my heroes were Jesse James, the James brothers, the younger brothers these gangsters, you know, these, these outlaws, and Belle Starr, because she was a woman, they were all Confederate guerrillas. They were all my childhood heroes were Confederate guerrillas. And here I was, I didn't even know that until I was 15 years old. And I was very anti-racist already, you know, and um, post-civil rights, and I, I didn't even know that what Jesse James had been, but he got transformed by Hollywood, you know, in, into a, just completely erased the um, backstory so that he was just, you know, the way that they shot up uh, anti-slavery people in Kansas was riding fast on horses with a six gun, uh, shooting into homes and shooting people. And that, you know, became the... And the signature of the cowboy and Indian boy is riding fast on a horse with a uh, firing a pistol, a sidearm rather than a rifle. Um, the Indians always had rifles. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's you know personally, I just didn't really become. I was really against gun laws because I don't think um, prohibition necessarily works and I still don't think it works. I mean nothing ever happens for one thing. Um that it that that shooter in Las Vegas had they think they found all his guns now. I think there is up to sixty weapons he had, high powered weapons, and not one of them was illegal. They were all legally bought. Um but he you know, he probably, uh, and he bought them in, in several states, including California. But would prohibition do anything? And I still, you know, I, um, I talk, gun rights, uh, gun control people come to my um, talks about, about the book. And um, they always think that, that, I will be on the side of, you know, gun control, but, and of course the NRA, but as I see it, you know, it's really not about money, NRA uh, money. They have, uh, they have uh, $30 million a year is their, is their budget. Um, that's just nothing for lobbying. They basically just monitor uh, every elected office in the country. It's much easier now electronically and they put out, there are NRA clubs in every nook and corner of this country. It's a grassroots thing, you know, and no prohibition is going to um, change that. Um, probably, it's not probably the full 30%. Many of those people own one gun. The average is nine. Nine guns per person. So, that's, you know, that's hoarding, definitely. If you think you need a shotgun for self-defense, you don't need nine of anything. So it's, um, it is, you know, it's, 
it's in the it's deep in the culture, but it's deep in that culture that we now see every day, unfortunately, of um, uh, that Trump has has given permission to. He, of course, is just you know exploiting it. He's completely the opposite. I don't think he even likes guns. His stupid son is a you know trophy hunter. So exotic and and um, endangered animal, but he's, you know, he has said that he's not interested in, in guns himself. So it's just, you know, for him, it's just his, his little army, um, which he has. So I think the militarization um, has increased the attraction to guns, the increased militarization, because it's always, I think we don't uh, consider enough how deeply, um, the military culture goes back to the very beginning of um, uh, of the colonies and how settler colonial how it worked where the settler colonists armed. There's a really good description of um, uh, from the early 1800s. Let me read, just read that. It's really short. It's um. A man named Joseph Doddridge, um, he's a minister, an early settler in the Ohio country, so right after independence. He writes, uh, he went to be a minister there, so it wasn't, it, you know, he wasn't familiar with this, with this culture, but he says these early settlers on the frontiers of this country were like Arabs of the desert of Africa in at least two respects. Every man was a soldier. And from early in the spring till late in the fall was almost continually in arms. Their work was often carried on by parties, each one of whom had his rifle and everything else belonging to his war dress. These were deposited in some central place in the field. A sentinel was stationed on the outside of the fence, so that on the least alarm the whole company repaired to their arms and were ready for combat in a moment. But of course, you know, what were they surrounded by? They were surrounded by native people whose land they had just taken and um, were trying to get it back uh, or, or uh, not expand farther. So you take that and you multiply it by 300 years moving across the continent in this way. That is a very deep militaristic culture. Um, so I think that's why um, people, you know, 70% of the population, when they're uh, questioned uh, and polls, uh, say that they're for gun control. But that same, same 70%, or maybe it's not the same 70%, but it's 70% say that they think the, the Second Amendment should be uh, respected. And of course, what I have to say about the Second Amendment is it should be abolished because of its racist content, that it is a, uh, you know, it was um, put in the Constitution by the, you know, really um, because there was no way to take the continent, which they already had maps saying that's what they wanted to do, the founders, that's what they had planned, was to get to the Pacific Ocean and also take Mexico. And it was, they had maps in the Northwest Ordinance, um, the Continental Congress, that that's what their, their plan was. There's no way they could build enough armies to, um, uh, to take all that land from pretty densely populated um, up to the Mississippi River with Native people, and then beyond that, you know, uh, Mexican people. Um, and um, there was just no way they could possibly do it. So they had to, uh, they made that choice. The British made it in establishing the colonies of that variety of colonialism that's rare, of settler colonialism. But it, it, um, it exists in Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, those other Anglo colonies. The Spanish saw it as so successful, they implemented it in Argentina and Chile. But it's genocidal, you know. They have 
to get that land, they have to um, wipe out or remove uh, the people already living there. And so that's the, um, uh, the armed citizenry has to exist to do that. And armies can't really, couldn't really, they never figured out how to fight with native peoples, guerrilla warfare, um, using count. They used counterinsurgency, um, uh, simply wiping out villages, burning their food stuff. That's the only, uh, and so that also um, developed into the army's culture. It was no surprise, you know, that counterinsurgency book was updated um, during the Iraq, uh, Iraq uh, occupation. So the militarism is is um, very deep, and you know, having located it in myself um, as a uh, just an example of a, this kind of um, um, unconscious militarism, not something obvious. Uh, although many of my generation did start going around in army fatigues and all uh, kind of civilian uh, militarization. So I think some of the, you know, uh, some of the, most of the veterans who come back from U.S. wars are um, the least likely people to um, be in love with militarism. That's why it's really important what you all are doing and, um, and organizing uh, veterans because they, they've seen the results of it. Um, and if they do gain a consciousness of, of it um, and, you know, really be a powerful force. Well, it's, um, it, it really is interesting how, as we always talk about empire comes home and, but also how culture and history within institutions like the military have this, both Native American and then also rugged frontiersmen facet to it. You know, I was in the uh, cavalry, which is really just another word for, you know, motorized or foot reconnaissance. Uh, but, you know, all of our history, like almost all of our mythology centers around the Indian Wars, M more so even than the Civil War. I mean, we wear the old we wear the old Stetson hats. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that all the helicopters in the U.S. Army are named after a variety of Native American tribes. Wow. But even just sort of the the language employed by military officers and politicians, right in in Vietnam and again in Iraq, you know. Indian country, hostile territory, all this uh, language. And then, of course, the gun ownership really just just plays into it, this this notion of rugged individualism, a, a civilizing mission. You know, I, I'm, you've been so generous with your time, but I'm going to close out with, you know, one final question that's appropriate to my uh, dorky nature. But, you know, one of the places where we've seen gun culture or at least the use of an armed populace right the infusion of weapons uh just really take a society apart with a lot of foreign backing uh was in central america and so uh as i regularly joke on the pod you know i like to do a fair amount of uh cyber stalking of our guests prior to their appearances although i promise it's nothing nefarious uh, but what interests me is sort of scholars and public officials past activism. We've talked a lot about that already with you. Uh, the subjects or issues that catalyze them decades before we got to chat, because I think that's the foundation. And of course, if I happen to find something that links to my own uh, side interests, you know, more's the better. But, you know, it, as you mentioned, in the 1980s, you traveled to, monitored, you know, we're, we're just an observer of the Nicaraguan Civil War in Central America. As you mentioned Reagan earlier, and this topic to me was the crucial region uh, and the most obscene axis of the sort of now canonized, you know, St. Ronald Reagan's foreign policy. It was certainly the bloodiest. Uh, so for most Americans who know anything at all about the U.S. role in Nicaragua, to say nothing of, you know, El Salvador or Guatemala, their knowledge likely stops at the vague term or phrase Iran-Contra, you know, a sort of poorly understood political, cultural touchstone that it's become. 
uh, yet the CIA backing training and arming of the Contras in Nicaragua and, you know, support for the literal priest and nun murdering Salvadoran right wing regime resulted in tens, if not hundreds of thousands of deaths. So, you know, some might shrug all that off as either necessary to defeat communism, if some people still think that way, or dismiss it as an, you know, at best mildly interesting long past history for dorks like like me. But I, of course, reject that. And so as we see, at least at least in the post second term Obama era, it seems that the shift of U.S. military activity worldwide, including in Latin America itself, uh, has gone from conventional troop occupations that we saw in the George W. Bush administration to more like bombing, spec ops raids, and most importantly, dishing the dirty work to local regional proxies. So with all that being said, I want to know how you think finally about your 1980 Central American experience today, specifically, you know, your key takeaways from that work, and then what is its relevance? And, you know, feel free to tell me if I'm stretching or playing crazy, but what is its relevance for today and America's foreign policy future moving forward? Yeah, well, we see at the border, you know, the results of um, all those wars with the refugees, um, almost all of them now are from Central America and um, the children in cages all around the country. Uh, and um, yeah, so these revolutions, you know, uh, of course you probably know um, that the United States um, has been meddling in Central America ever since the Central American Republic as such became independent in 1830. Um, it became independent as a federation of the whole isthmus, you know, from um, Costa Rica to um, in, into Mexico, you know, took the big hunk of Guatemala later. But it was a unitary federation and um, it only lasted 23 years because both the British and the United States um, what imperialism, you know, what, what um, U.S. and British imperialism especially are good at uh, and focus on is, um, is segmenting peoples. Um, I think the whole Southeast Asian, you know, war was to make sure that um, there wasn't a federation. Of, and they succeeded in that, if nothing else, um, by millions of people. Uh, so Central America, they broke it down, but it's always had this, this, um, and then they each became separate banana republics, you know, competing with each other for the, for the U.S. and world market. And the same with the Caribbean, you know, they did that also with CARICOM in the 20th century, breaking it down into the Caribbean nations, each with their tropical fruits uh, and uh, aluminum uh, bauxite. Uh, competing against each other. So that's how, you know, imperialism really works to keep, not allow any kind of um, sprouting up of a powerful subregion of the world that might be influential. So clearly Central America um, was, you know, never left alone by the United States. They occupied uh, Nicaragua three different times. Uh, and this was always the Marine Corps um, invading, you know, occupying, especially northeastern uh, Nicaragua, and um, meddling in the affairs of all of the Central American countries. So that, you know, when they came up to the Kennedy administration, supposedly a um, reforming relations with Latin America, they offered the, um, uh, you know, the aid um, for development development aid. And um, they all took it, except, you know, it had its strings and all, but El Salvador didn't take it. They, um, so what the Kennedy administration did was they were, okay, then if you don't do something development, you're going to need a lot of military aid. So they gave them, the, you know, armed the dictatorship. And, you know, in most places they did both um, because if the poverty, continues, there's going to be a revolution, you know, you've got to, 
create the middle sectors, the middle, you know, that's all we did in Latin American history, and we're the middle sectors within a revolution. So they, they meddling, um, there were attempts at revolution, of course, in Guatemala, which is the largest country and uh, most populous in Central America. Um, they had uh, a peaceful, actually peaceful, transition uh, from dictatorship to a democratically elected um, president who was then followed by another democratically elected president. And um, the United States fomented a coup um, to um, overthrow that democracy. Of course, this has been one uh, horrible military dictator after another. Um, and in Nicaragua, uh, they never even got close to that kind of um, uh, democratic um, situation. They, after the Sandino, you know, the um, the first Sandinistas, the Sandino fight against the Marines, the United States, and um, drove them out. Actually, um, he went in to you know to to actually create an autonomous zone of North. Eastern Nicaragua that would be socialist, and um, and of course he was assassinated, and the, the, um, the Somoza family then um, took over. So in each one of these cases, you know, the in El Salvador they simply massacred uh, all of. Uh, they thought, you know, all, all the native people except those who hid out and changed their clothing and didn't speak their language anymore, the Nahuatl people, Asol um, And they were the base of Farabundo Marti's uh, guerrilla army, um, completely um, uh, suppressed and wiped out. So in the 50s after Guatemala, it looked you know, really bleak, but in Nicaragua, um, and in Guatemala, another uh, another um, resistance movement under Tercio Lima um, rose. He was a he was a a, a, a lower rank uh, army officer uh, who, who was really within the military. Uh, he took a bunch of military people with him, so it was a very militaristic fight. Um, and but again, the U.S. intervened and and. Um, uh, put it out. So the one that that started really having some um, some possibilities was the um, uh, FSLN, the Sandinista Front, and um, it started in the um, in the fifties. Really, you know, it, it began in the fifties um, and started building, and slowly, you know, they built up a. a university students and into the, um, it's very hard under a dictatorship. Many of them were in prison for the entire time of the, um, of the Sandinista fight, like Thomas Borges was uh, in prison, but, and Daniel Ortega was in prison. So they were able to, um, uh, you know, Carter was very, uh, uh, pers you know, he, he had a perception of, how they wouldn't be able to govern. So why not pull out, you know, just pull out the dictator? Everyone in the world hated him by then, the Samosa, um, such a foul person and, you know, all the deaths. They had like 56,000 people out of 1.5 million people uh, killed. Um, but the Sandinistas actually, uh, I can attest to the fact that they didn't know how to govern, but they were learning, you know, they were learning as they did it. And they were very sincere. They brought in every international institution. So for those of us who know the, you know, international things, that they can't go to any country unless they're invited. And so they invited everyone in, the WHO, the UNESCO with their language programs, the, the um, refugees, the UNHCR, um, and Nicaragua started taking a lot of refugees. They had a lot of um, 
Guatemalan uh, Mayan refugees and also Salvadoran refugees. And so they, you know, they, they had this internationalist um, uh, scope anyway. And they, this of course gave great courage to the FMLN in El Salvador and the, and the, um, um, and the different, there were five different guerrilla groups in, uh, in um, in Guatemala that then formed a unitary political front. So, yeah, so I, I went down um, first in 1981 um, because there were disturbances out in that northeastern zone, you know, where you know it worked. This was the Mosquitia, the Mosquito Indians. And we had uh, met them, you know, in uh, international. They came under Samosa, um, so the Moravian missionaries, uh, they, they Samosa kind of just turned that area over to the Moravian missionaries and the other American missionaries. Um, and so they weren't really bothered that much by um, the Samosa regime, although they were poor and, you know, dependent on, on missionaries and a lot of malnutrition and horrible conditions of, um, of life. Um, but they had some, you know, the Moravians actually sent some to universities. So there were, you know, a class of educated, um, uh, some doctors and, and lawyers. Um, so they came to our first international meeting in 77, we were a little suspicious because the Samosa and um, they had their own organization, Alpha Miso. But after the Sandinistas came in, they really didn't know. Um, the ones in the United States did, there was a very large Nicaraguan population, half the population practically of Nicaragua lived in San Francisco so, um, in the mission district. They were, you know, they had um, come for jobs and the United States didn't even require papers from Nicaraguans. Um, there were a lot of skilled workers. So it was a, it was a, um, a, uh, a way of getting rid of any militancy. Young people said, well, we'll go to the United States and work, or go into the U.S. Army, and then get the GIA bill. So they, we had San, San Francisco was Sandinista North America a center uh, all during, you know, the guerrilla fight in the 70s. And then um, afterwards, most of them went back uh, to work in the, and some of them went and fought also in the uh, southern front and so i had a you know i had a deep interest i knew them they were friends and um a lot of them born in the united states and spoke perfect english so you know there was a, a easy affinity with solidarity from the united states that formed very quickly and then spilled over into the other parts of central america um, but this um, disturbing incident out, out on the uh, on the Caribbean coast, which they call the Atlantic coast, uh, um, they um, a group had formed uh, around a leader who um, you know were anti-communist. You know, the Moravian raised American evangelical. You know, very anti-communist. And so when the Sandinistas came in and, and started trying to, you know, form collectives and do some of the things they had done in the East, they were a little clumsy about it because they didn't know the culture well and probably trusting the Moravians too much, uh, more than they should have um, put things in their hands. And they were, you know, um, disrupting everything that the Sandinistas did. That was very obvious to me right away. But I got invited down to um, by some friends who were um, formerly been in San Francisco to, uh, and had gotten very involved in the American Indian movement. That's how we knew most of them. They were very involved. And the, um, Carlos Fonseca from the mountains, you know, had sent a letter to Wounded Knee, um, expressing solidarity with the um, uh, wounded knee 1973. So there was a really a close affinity with the American Indian movement. So I went down 
um, first to check it out and um, see what I could ascertain, you know, just to, I didn't know, you know, the Mosquito culture that well or the area, I've never been to Central America. But just to, you know, get a get a sense of it. But what I did know really well were evangelicals because I was raised a Baptist. I really know their tricks very well. You know, so um, it wasn't hard to figure out what they were trying to do. And um, because they thought, because I was from the U.S., they told me a lot of things, you know, because uh, they thought I was on their side. And I just listened and took notes and, you know, figured out. Well, you know, and they were working already with the U.S. Um, uh, State Department. Of course, this was the, the uh, Reagan State Department. And uh, um, they made a um, huge uh, um, deal out of fighting communism in, in Nicaragua. And um, it was... It was Pretty amazing. I uh, what we were up against, you know, fighting that propaganda that was coming out. They actually formed a uh, uh, a um, publicity department devoted. Pat Buchanan was in charge of it, uh, devoted to propaganda against the Sandinistas. It was just, and they focused on the Mosquitos and claimed that the Sandinistas had killed tens of thousands. Of only 70,000 mosquito people population total in Nicaragua. And uh, Jean Kirkpatrick uh, announced on, you know, the, she was UN ambassador in the United Nations that the Sandinistas had killed 200,000 mosquito Indians. And there weren't even that many. And, and you know, I, uh, I wouldn't. Ch I I kept going down there to check out things because I didn't know what was true and what was not true for sure. But I would go down and I would actually meet the people who supposedly had been killed. They often were across the border in Honduran refugee camps, and um, so it was. It was really um, to see that uh, up close, and also to be in a war zone with U.S. Uh, warships off coast, off the coast, you could see them, you know, in the Caribbean. And there are warplanes buzzing in the place. You know, I, it was the first time I had ever been under attack by the United States, you know, to see a little bit what it feels like. And um, it's terrifying, you know. So it, it's, uh, it was... Um, it was really, really an impossible task to, um, the U.S. really wants something and wants to really devote itself to destroying a country of 2,000 people. You can't keep them from doing it, you know. And um, that's the, you know, really sad thing. And to see now, what's interesting is uh, the Sandinistas came back in power um, during the George W. Bush administration, when the U.S. wasn't looking very closely, what was going on. And um, they're not exactly like the old FSON. They cannot be, but they have, they built some institutions. Uh, one is the land reform and the collectives that still exist. They developed Via Campesina, which is an international um, peasantry organization that's in every every third world country now and um it's still based in in uh, in Nicaragua so the when the first uh unaccompanied children came from Central America in uh, 2000 um, um 11 12 it was under Obama second term uh, I don't know if you remember it, but it was a huge, huge tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands uh, of unaccompanied children from Central America. Not one of them was from Nicaragua, not one. And in this last, you know, the, uh, last two years of uh, the caravans and all, not one single Nicaraguan refugee, um, because they've been able to, what they did was, um, they didn't create socialism, but they did uh, almost totally destroy in income inequality. 
so kind of everyone is, you know, more or less poor, some are poorer than others, but uh, they have food sovereignty, total food sovereignty in Nicaragua and, um, and no gangs, you know, until two years ago when uh, the U.S. unleashed the Salvadoran gangs to go down and um, try to overthrow, they did, were not successful. They caused a lot of damage, but it really shows that Nicaragua is now listed with Venezuela and Cuba, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, as the troika of tyranny by, what's his name? <laughs> oh, by Bolton, of course, yes. Yeah, Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's um, so much of what you said is fascinating. You know, two big points. Uh, well, first of all, the, the Bolton Troika thing. I love the uh, enemy idioms that we uh, peddle in so much. Uh, in fact, it's fun, though, because sometimes as a historian, you get to see like a very much a back to the future sort of effect. Whereas, you know, Reagan included Nicaragua in his uh, uh, terrorist murder, Inc. group of five. Right. Which no one remembers that he, I mean, he used mafia language. You think that Trump would have taken that on, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really incredible as is what you said, which is if the United States wants something, you know, even though it tends to lose its bigger wars since second world war, if it wants something, uh, it can achieve it with enormous firepower. And yet one is left hoping or wishing that we would use that power for greater ends or more ethical ends. And it just, of course, has generally not been the case. And a laboratory for that, have you, as you've noted, has been Central America, which is our backyard, as we like to say, as our admirals repeatedly say, who command as imperial proconsuls South come. So this is really just all, I think, incredibly relevant. I, I think that America, it, the empire doesn't go away. It just morphs. Uh, it changes clothes. And so, you know, getting bogged down in Iraq or Afghanistan, that's out of style for a while, at least. And so I think we'll see a lot more of this proxy warfare, uh, which stays under the radar, but is often bloodier, or at least as bloody. And again, for a laboratory, it's hard to find a place better than Nicaragua or El Salvador or Guatemala, to say nothing of the Arab world. So this is really Great stuff. Well, well, Roxanne, we, we, we've kept you for quite a while, and, and I'm so thankful for your time. I mean, I know people are busy and struggling in all kinds of different ways. Uh, I will say I think that we did a pretty good job uh, of making the episode not all about corona, although we uh, hit some inflection points that are necessary. Uh, so as we wrap up, is, is there anything you're working on now or someplace that you would point – or direct our listeners to, to, to catch uh, your existing work? Well, I am working on a book. So, you know, the isolation is not too bad for me because the book was overdue. Uh, it is about the border, you know, the Central American refugees and the wars. And um, in general, about this whole idea that the United States is a nation of immigrants. Uh, so, I um, I am working on that, and it's much on my mind. But uh, another thing I've been really thinking about, I met a um, uh, Iraq vet against the war, um, a representative up in um, when I was in um, uh, Washington State. Uh, oh, it was about it was about four years ago, and he put an idea in my mind I had never thought of before about. Um, the um, how we should start thinking about how the military could be transformed, the U.S. military, because it's very hard to think of getting rid of it completely or just reducing the budget, you know. I mean, uh, even if it were half of what it is now, it could still destroy almost any country in the world or, or the whole world. And he was talking about, you know, repurposing the military for the time ahead where we're going to be suffering, you know, climate catastrophe. And already there are, you know, huge numbers of refugees everywhere. I just read in today's paper, there are 3 million Afghan refugees in Iran. And um, uh, so there are Afghan refugees all over the world. There are refugees everywhere. And 
and it's only beginning, the climate refugees that are going to come. So I, I hope you all are thinking about that too. I don't know how widespread it is and you know, um, that little group there, that small group of Iraq vets against the war, we're kind of taking it on and I haven't checked back with them, but it, it, it's really in my mind, it came to mind, you know, how, how nicely the military did perform. I was, you know, I said, oh no, uh, when the tsunami happened in Indonesia and, you know, the, and, and went over, you know, Sri Lanka and all, the U.S. military really played a very good role in, you know, in that catastrophic condition using their warships. And um, uh, so I did, you know, I mean, that was before, but I thought back to that and how, how I think people in the military would really prefer that to having to kill people. <laughs> also. So I don't know, maybe that's a dreamy thing, but I, I don't know if you've all thought about it, but I hope you will. Well, absolutely. And uh, we're both, uh, Henry and I are members of Iraq Veterans Against the War, which uh, now calls itself about face to allow, you know, the veterans of Afghanistan and other sundry wars in. But, you know, that this is an important topic. I mean, we saw the HMS Comfort, the naval ship go to New York City, you know, with limited right. effect, but it's still kind of a symbolic move. And, uh, and I do think that there's aspects of the military that, uh, are efficient and effective and could be better purposed. And I think this is, this is a key thing because as you point out, you know, uh, it's hard to imagine spending more money for less output than we have post nine 11, you know, fighting these brush fires that we largely create. But the reality is that uh, climate crisis and pandemic and everything associated with it, refugees, these are the existential threats moving forward. And no amount of aircraft carriers, as I said on the radio in DC this morning, counting our aircraft carriers is not necessarily going to solve that. You know, you, you can't count uh, dollars spent on defense for outputs on protecting us from the real threat, right? Which is, which is a global collective threat. So we're thinking about it. I'm going to write more about it. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad you brought it up. But, uh, well, Roxanne, thanks so much. Uh, we'll, we'll close out here. And I hope we can do this again because I feel like there's a million directions you can go in. And when you uh, complete or are near complete or the book comes out for publication, your next work, then we're definitely going to do another episode if you're willing. Great. Thank you, Danny. Thank all of you. And it was really great talking to you. Thanks, Roxanne. Great. Talk to you soon. Bye. Take care. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention. I will know.